Hey, this is Rob, and this is episode 32 of the Folly Coffee Podcast. Let's get it brewing. All right. So for this episode, obviously, e-commerce has become a much bigger priority for a lot of businesses, Folly Coffee included. We have been focusing on the website. We've been focusing on the subscription. We've been doing a little bit of Google ad placements, this and that. But overall, our ad spending has been incredibly, incredibly low. And so I have been wanting to figure out more about paid advertisements digitally. And so today we have a digital content specialist, official title, media supervisor. Uh, she was recently nominated for the AdFed 2020 32 Under 32 Award. Uh, and she also happens to be my sister. Please welcome Emily Baith. Enjoy. So this episode, uh, as a part of COVID-19 closures, obviously a lot of businesses have been like readjusting to focus digitally, us included. At this point, I've not done any digital advertising. Uh, the only paid advertising I've done is like the really simple Google, like pay-per-click, basically so if someone actually Googles Folly Coffee, Folly Coffee shows up. And so my sister here, Emily, is in digital marketing. And so I was like, who better to interview about paid advertising? I was like starting to pick her brain about it. And then I go, oh, wait, this would actually be a great podcast episode. So why don't you kind of introduce yourself? What do you do for a living? What does that entail? And then, yeah, your background. Yeah, so I work in digital marketing and advertising at an agency called Forward at Bain. Um, so we're owned by a consultancy called Bain and Company, but we ultimately run digital media across all sorts of platforms, whether it's Google Ads, like you mentioned, Facebook and Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, TikTok, YouTube, banner ads, like all of those sorts of channels. Um, so my focus has primarily been in the paid social channels. Um, Amazon is another one I didn't mention, but um, yeah, so we'll run campaigns across all those sorts of platforms for different companies. Um, so I've worked there for four years now, so I've been pretty immersed in um, digital media throughout my years there, and I interned there before that um, after graduating from the University of Missouri. So um, yeah, digital media. Ultimately, what my role is within there is deciding what budget to place on what platform, um, what platforms are we going to run on, all of those sorts of decisions that are where the ad's going to go, um, whereas the creative team might you know, design those ads, so I'm more of the activation side of things. So typically, when a new client is signed on, are they coming to you with specific goals in mind, or do you guide them more on what you think they should do? Yeah, so a client will definitely come to us with goals in mind. Um, typically, we bucket them into awareness and conversion campaigns. So awareness is going to be much more for like your smaller brands that might need to drive more reach against an audience just to have people learn the brand name and people might not have heard of them before. Um, and then conversion is going to be more of those brands where people know who they are, but they want to drive purchases, they want to drive leads, they want to drive more of those lower funnel metrics. Um, Whereas with awareness, you know, if it's a smaller brand, you know, I might not convert you to a sale right away. I might need to tell you more about who I am and why I'm better than competitors first. So those tend to be the most common buckets of the ways that we'll group campaigns and prioritize how we're going to run them and what channels we're going to run on. And what are the sizes of companies that you've worked with? Do you have one kind of size that you specifically work with or is it a full range? Um, I started working on fairly small brands, and now I'm starting to translate that knowledge to a lot larger brands, um, which is kind of funny because the mentality truly is the same, whether you're a small brand or a larger one, in terms of how you buy media, how you would run these campaigns. Um, so I've kind of worked with all sizes, um, but with these larger brands that I work with now, it's more of like a consultancy type relationship. So I'll come in and maybe more so make recommendations of how they could improve what they're doing. Um, so kind of a wide variety. So let, I'm going to start as far away from Folly as I possibly can, just to get an understanding of that side and zero it more towards probably what I want to do with Folly and what you might advise there. And so let's take a really large company, really well-known brand that you've worked with, or just let's say it's a new client onboarding. It's a brand that everybody's heard of, really high awareness. So they're probably going to be trying to drive conversion. 
what is the type of strategy you would take there of somebody who's got really high brand awareness, they're trying to drive conversion. What kind of metrics are you using? What kind of campaign are you setting up to get people to, I guess in this case, conversion would be like online sales? Yeah, so amidst COVID, e-com is definitely the most common lower funnel KPI that we're seeing with clients. What does KPI stand for? Key performance indicator, sorry. Um, so ultimately it really depends, A, does the client have e-com on their website? And if they do, then you know that KPI is gonna be more of a purchase or maybe an add to cart. Um, so we'll look at things like add to cart rate, purchase rate, um, cost per purchase, you know, purchase value, things like that. Um, if a client doesn't have e-com, then, you know, let's say Folly didn't on the website, then that would be probably more of a conversion of like a store locator search. So if someone completes a search on the store locator, you know, that's the closest thing we can get to, okay, this person has intent to buy in store. Um, so those are the sorts of conversion rates we'll look at um, for those indicators of success. And I think with any large brand, you know, people might say, well, people know who I am, so I don't need to drive awareness. But it really isn't that simple because people might know who you are, but you might have a new product, you might have a new promo, like there's always things that you want to drive awareness of. So. I often challenge people to not think just in the sense of like, well, people know my brand, so I don't need to think about making them aware of anything about it. Um, but those tend to be more of the metrics I will focus on. Whereas with awareness, then it's more reach. So how many people am I reaching in my target audience? Um, how much am I paying to reach those people? Um, I might look at a secondary KPI, like a click-through rate or something like that. I might add more of that ad engagement. Um, instead of what are people actually doing once they click through. And how do you determine what is a successful return on investment for a program? Because that's one thing I kind of get worried about is that we're really lean, so I'm very careful about where we spend our money. And so return on investment is a huge deal for me and being able to track that. And so for an online campaign, how do I determine what a good ROI is? Is it, Can I expect to run a paid advertisement of some sort and get a positive ROI for selling through product? Yeah, it's really dependent on the channel first because, you know, the Google ads that you mentioned you've done, like people are seeking out coffee, people are seeking out folly. So their intent is really high. That return is going to look really strong. But then when you think about like a social media, then, you know, that attribution window that you're looking at of people buying, you know, they're not going to buy right when they click through a lot of the times, like they might from a Google ad. They might save it, come back to it later, wait a week, evaluate a couple other brands. You know, they're not as high intent when they're getting served that ad. So you have to think about like, what's that window that I wanna look at for when people are purchasing to determine that ROI? Because when you compare a Google ad to a Facebook ad, it's gonna make the Facebook ad not look great. But in reality, someone might have seen that Facebook ad, then gone to search for it on Google, and then Google gets the credit. So you have to think about the channel, what is the attribution that's appropriate for that channel, um, and then also, you know, how much does it cost you? How much are you spending to run the ad? Obviously, you know, what's your profit margin? Like there's a lot of other factors that come into play for ROAS um, or ROI to make sure that you have a goal that's appropriate for your brand, for your product. Like every product, you know, for Folly theoretically should have a different um, ROI or ROAS goal, depending on, you know, price of product and all those other factors that come into play. Are, are you saying ROAS? Yeah. Return on ad spend. Return on yeah. ad spend. Okay. These are things I need to know. Return on ad spend. Generally anything above a $1 ROAS means you're making more than you're spending, but you know, with all the other factors that come into play that there could be other factors of why you set a higher ROAS goal than like a dollar. Yeah, because my understanding would be the strategy I'm looking at is probably one where profitability is not as important because we're very low awareness. The return on investment, I'm not necessarily looking to be extremely profitable from ads as much as trying to gain new customers. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of what you're referring to of being closer to a dollar, or even potentially below a dollar to reach new customers? Yeah, I think with where you're at, you know, you want to get the word out, right? So maybe for that, you know, ROAS is like a secondary KPI that you look at, but it's not going to be your primary, you know, especially with a limited ad budget. It's pretty expensive to optimize to things like purchases on site, 
Whereas, you know, in an awareness-based campaign where I'm optimizing more to just delivering my ads to as many people as possible for the lowest cost, you know, my ROIS might look low, but realistically for my small ad budget, I'm reaching way more people. I'm getting the word out way more effectively. And then, you know, with that audience, there's a lot of things you can do to reach those people with more messages. So let's say I target you with a video ad about folly then you know once you've viewed three seconds of that now i can have you in a separate retargeting pool so you know with that media i reach a ton of people i have my audience of people who watch my video and then i can retarget them with an ad that's more focused on shop now buy now um you know check out our new products like more of that messaging that makes sense because i know these people have seen this video now they know who folly is now it makes sense for me to tell them to buy but if i led with that buy now messaging you know if someone doesn't know who i am they're not going to go through and buy right away so you know what is that messaging sequence that makes sense um but yeah for you it would be more of optimizing to just impressions, getting a bunch of people to see your ads. And so it can get specific as that, is you can create a multi-layered approach where I've got one ad that's to get your attention, that's not trying to sell you on anything, mm -hmm. and create a group of, a set of parameters that if you interacted with it in this way, if you watched it for this long, I can now blast you with another ad that's, hey, you were maybe interested in that video, here's a shop now, here's a thing that you were looking at earlier. Oh yeah, so most of the time when people think their phones are listening to them, it's really just like, you probably went and visited someone's Instagram profile, you probably even accidentally watched part of a video ad, like there's so many ways within Facebook and Instagram in particular that you can retarget people, so um, lots of options there in terms of qualifying the people you're serving your ads to instead of just random people, um, you know, so those are more based off of ad engagement, but you know, for fall, you could target people who are interested in coffee. So people who are engaging with coffee-related content or like other coffee shops around Minneapolis. You know, there's a bunch of other qualifiers you can do to make sure it's the right people. But with COVID, you know, if you have e -com on your site, then everyone, like, you could have a lot more options for who to target. Whereas, you know, let's say you had a coffee shop, then, like, only Minneapolis would be applicable. So you see people leaning a lot more into more of that strategy rather than the geography because it just doesn't really matter with e-com as much. And with, especially with COVID, with being local purchasing, is there's an increased focus on it. Do you think it, it's better for a small locally based company with a, like a stronger following? Like Folly, we have a, a stronger local following. Most of our customers, the broad majority are, are in the Twin Cities, even online. Is it a better idea to try to reach a more specific targeted person, someone that is more likely to be interested in Folly and high-end specialty coffee on a national scale? Or is it better to focus on the local population because there's that stronger like Minnesota connection in this case? Yeah, I think starting with the Minneapolis area makes the most sense. It's going to be relatively cheap to reach like a majority of people who live around here, even without any targeting overlaid. Um, so starting with that makes the most sense because you'll have that tie. But I think it's a testing opportunity. And, and that's what we say a lot at work is really just test, test, test and learn because, you know, the Minnesota made and roasted you know, we think is primarily appealing to people in Minnesota, right? But maybe, you know, other parts of the Midwest find that appealing. Um, I mean, the packaging alone, if I got targeted with that on Instagram in an ad and I'm a coffee nut, you know, I would want to click through and learn more about it. And I wouldn't be like, oh, it's not a local brand. I would still just know it's not Starbucks. It's not the big players that I would probably in this environment still feel like I'm supporting a smaller brand. I mean, I buy stuff off of Instagram all the time off of ads. Um, and a lot of the times it's those brands that I haven't heard of. And I still in this environment feel good to like support a brand that's not just one I already know. Um, so yeah, I think starting with what you know makes the most sense and then expanding and testing where it makes sense. Um, also where you have distribution. So right now, Obviously, stores aren't open, but I know like there's a store in Chicago that carries it. So, um, you know, it would make sense to target around there or like Rochester, wherever the other places are um, that you can buy it. So focusing around that, too. And, and then in terms of the channels, I've, I've heard a lot of Facebook, Instagram. How do you weigh those against each other? And are there other platforms that are really effective for 
paid advertising. You've mentioned Google as well. Yeah, so Facebook and Instagram, as far as all the social platforms go, are going to have the most scale. So you're going to be able to spend the most, reach the most people. Um, They're just the most sophisticated in the space. Um, I would look at a Pinterest as well. Pinterest has come out with a lot of really awesome things as of late. Um, They're great for like a discovery platform and people are searching for inspiration and ideas and um, they're in that shopping mindset as well. They're searching for things you can type by keyword of what they're searching for. Um, So Pinterest, you know, TikTok is a very, very new ad platform. It's definitely not going to drive conversion like we were talking about. That's much more of an awareness play and probably for bigger brands. Um, So TikTok, you know, Snapchat has a lot of really awesome targeting capabilities and just cool ad formats of like lenses and filters that you can do. Um, Google ads, you know, the search ads, as I mentioned, are going to just consistently lead to great results because people are seeking that out. Um, YouTube's great for awareness. Um, You know, there's other video ad formats that you can run just across the open web. But if anyone is just like trying to start with advertising, they have no idea about the landscape or where to go. You know, Google ads and like Facebook are usually the best starting point. I just always advise people to be wary of how, you know, a Facebook can really almost take advantage of those advertisers that don't know that much because they're like, oh, if you just click this boost button and click two more things, you can have your ad launched. But things that are happening behind the scenes are really not how you would want to spend your dollars. You know, they might not be optimizing the right thing. Your audience might not be right. Um, you know, you're not really controlling that ad once it's running and optim, like you're not really pulling any levers to make it do well. You're just kind of saying, here's my money, Google or Facebook, you know, figure out how to spend it. Um, so I think really digging into the details of those platforms rather than just launching it and saying, okay, well, it's live. Um, that's the best place to start. Um, just to make sure that, you know, you're being cost efficient and you're getting the results you want. And how much does demographic play into which platform you end up deciding to focus on primarily with a brand? Yeah, it's definitely important. Obviously, TikTok and Snapchat skew much younger. Um, Pinterest skews very female. That's another reason with Facebook and Instagram that they're just a no-brainer because you're going to get pretty much every demo, males and females, that are on both platforms. Um, So that definitely has a role in which platforms we decide. Um, We also have to think about, you know, if we're running on like three platforms at once, how much of that is really overlap between the platforms. Um, You know, Snapchat in particular is good at like incremental people that you might not reach on Facebook. Um, You also have to think about like time spent in apps. So people are spending a really long time in TikTok right now, you know, whereas Facebook is, despite it being you know, one of those platforms that people are deleting their accounts and they're like, I don't even check my Facebook. They still have the most scale, but, you know, time spent in app isn't going to be as high as scrolling an Instagram feed or watching TikTok, especially right now. Um, like time spent in all of these apps is up so much in COVID. So, uh, and I feel like, especially with younger people, it's like a flex to be like, oh, I don't do Facebook at all. I, I'm, I'm thinking about deleting it. But how many people do you actually know that have deleted it? Yeah. I think it's more of like this weird flex of like, oh, no, I, Facebook's like the thing of the past, but everybody's still on. Well, oh, I just have to have it because like it's really good for events. That's, yeah. a, that's it. But then they're checking it just as much as their Instagram. Yeah. And the way that people are using it is changing. You know, you're going to Facebook for different things than Instagram. And, you know, you aren't really going to Facebook to consume, like, photo content, and you're not really going there to share as much anymore. But, yeah, events and, uh, like, Marketplace and Messenger, like, those sorts of things um, are really making them stand out. And, I mean, time after time, you know, these apps that emerge, like TikTok, you know, if they were going to get to the scale of Facebook, it would be years. Like, Facebook is just people can't really compete with them in terms of scale. So as much as these other emerging platforms are even like Reddit, you know, some of these other social platforms that emerge, um, they're great for unique ad offerings, unique targeting and incremental people. But um, yeah, Facebook and Instagram is going to be just a no brainer place to start. What is the thought, because TikTok is so early on in its development, and I think it will continue to pick up new users because it's just like extremely addictive, yeah. 
What is the thought on running a peer awareness play just to gain a bigger following early on with even though conversion because the way I look at TikTok and I've said this before is what it is now is not what it'll be in five years. Mm -hmm. Like Instagram, when it started, all it was was a photo editing app. It made your pictures look neat and you did it mostly for that. Or you saw it to see other people have awesome photos. Uh, and Facebook was like a way to connect with just your friends or people that you knew. And then it kind of evolved from there. I don't think TikTok will be what it is in five years from now. And so would there be any real value, kind of more of like a long-term play of running TikTok ads purely to try to gain a following? And if I were to do that, so if I'm just like, I'm going to be the specialty coffee TikTok roaster, like, which is, again, there's not many coffee roasters doing it. So if you want to be on top of that little hill of being the best coffee roaster in terms of following on TikTok, is that something that might be worth it? Just almost as a gamble of in five years, it could be something way bigger and having a bigger following now could pay off? Yeah. In general, when people try to focus on followers, I tend to advise against that just because, I mean, Facebook alone has done a ton of studies that show that, you know, having higher follower counts like doesn't correlate to people buying in store. So, um, you know, that's not true organically. That's not like your current followers. That's not to say that about them, but that's to say, you know, let's say I spent my ad budget entirely optimizing to people liking my posts, sharing them, commenting. Like what Facebook has found is that you know, when you do that, it doesn't correlate to buying as much as if you optimize to things like ad recall, which is a Facebook metric that's based off of like, how long is the ad in view in your feed for? Um, or, you know, those conversion metrics we were talking about. So followers, I think, were really, really important like four or five years ago when the early days of Facebook ad platform didn't have as many other options for you to optimize to. Um, you know, TikTok too, it, your followers don't matter as much because any video can pick up and be viral off of nothing. So with ads, um, one distinction to make is that a lot of them are what I call dark. So, you know, I might be running a Facebook ad that you might not see on my actual profile or same with Instagram, you might not see it on my profile. And so that's what I call dark. Um, so, you know, this TikTok ad is going to be dark. So if you get a bunch of views on the ads, you know, people aren't going to be able to see that on your profile. So a lot of brands really have an issue with that because they're like, well, if I'm paying to get all these people to see this ad and all these likes and views aren't going to show up on my profile, then other people can't see this and basically think that I got it organically. Um, so that's one important thing to think about is that dark ad distinction of, you know, you want it to work for you, not for others and how they're going to perceive it. Um, so I think with TikTok for brands, you know, that virality is probably going to come a lot more in their organic content or if they do those big ad partnerships like the hashtag challenges or like those takeovers that are super expensive, um, you know, that's probably more where those sorts of things will catch on. Um, but I think, you know, if you were going to run a TikTok ad, first of all, they're very cheap to run right now. Like, um, a common metric we'll use for brand awareness campaigns is CPM, which is basically the cost per thousand impressions. And it's like two bucks on TikTok, whereas Facebook is usually like six. Um, so it's very, very cheap to advertise right now. Um, there aren't a ton of advertisers in the space because it is pretty new. There aren't very sophisticated targeting options so that's the sacrifice you make like i couldn't target minneapolis i'd have to target all of minnesota you know things like that with the new ad platforms right when they come out you know you're very limited but it's super cheap to advertise you're going to be one of the few advertisers there um so there's pros and cons for sure interesting kind of makes me want to do it <laughs> um so another thing that i've been wary about is in spending money, I, I want like high accountability for who I'm giving my money to. If I'm paying you for especially a marketing service, I want to know that the ROI is good. And one thing I worry about is ultimately the ad itself. So I think a lot of people talk about like, well, per click and per viewing time, 
where does responsibility generally fall for the ad itself? At Forward, are you also creating the ad campaign for these clients? Yeah, so I think the accountability comes into play a lot with that attribution that we talked about of making sure you have methodology in place. So, you know, a Facebook pixel on your website, you know, installing something like that is a way to track what people do once they get to your website. Um, site analytics and that's platforms. that's called Facebook pixel? Yeah, the pixel. So it's like a bunch of code that you would put on your website. So when I run an ad, you know, I can retarget someone who's been there because that Facebook pixel fires when they land there from my ad. So, you know, the ad platforms have their own pixels. Um, there's also, you know, site analytics platforms where, you know, this is nitty gritty, but I can put tagging p parameters in my URL. So I can tag my URL of like follycoffee.com source Facebook um, and then, you know, when they land on my website, then I can isolate all the people who came from Facebook and look at all my site metrics. So that is a really easy way to be able to, in your site platform, let's say you're running a bunch of channels, you can look at how all those metrics compare. Um, so, you know, when you get targeted with social ads, if you click through and actually look at the long tail URL, um, weird, interesting thing I like to do to see, you know, what campaign I'm a part of, what audience I'm a part of. Like a lot of the times you can pick that out from just what's in the URL when you click through. Um, so a lot of the e-com clients especially rely really heavily on those site metrics to understand what am I actually getting out of this and, you know, bounce rate. Like if I, if all my Facebook traffic is bouncing, like right when they land to site, then whoever's running my media is probably not doing a great job of like qualifying the people who are getting there. So in that way, you could say we're getting people there. It's your website itself that's not driving. Yeah, there's some things that, you know, in an agency relationship, if you don't manage the website, then that's out of your control. Um, it's really hard to attribute to, right? Because there's so many factors. It could be the platform you're running on. It could be your creative. It could be who you're targeting. It could be your landing page experience. Like there's so many factors that come into play that it's hard to know what is the issue or on the flip side, what is making us do so well. Um, so a lot of the times those tests where we only are like focusing on one thing that we're changing, that helps us to identify, you know, if we test three audiences, then we can be confident that one audience was the best because every audience got the same ad, you know, tests like that are really the best way to know like what element it was that drove that. And so the ad itself, where, where do you start? So if, if I'm, if I'm looking at, let's say I, I want to just sell a bag of coffee, where's the, what do I do? Is it, a, is it a picture I'm putting up there? Do I try to use a video? Like what's the most engaging content? If I want something that's going to pull somebody in, is there kind of a, a, a general, I don't know, template or something that you're like, this is what a great ad looks like. It's a photo that has these elements or a video that has these elements. Yeah. I think for people who don't know your brand, the first exposure, generally video is going to drive the best awareness. Um, you know, you think about TV ads, um, those are really going to be the best at capturing user attention. Um, with those, you have to make sure you're optimizing correctly because, you know, if I'm optimizing to purchase on site, my video watch time is going to be really low, like two to three seconds. But, you know, if I'm optimizing to get people to watch that and engage with it, then it's going to be really strong. So with those awareness exposures, video, you know, Instagram stories, um, Instagram explore in that search tab, you know, you can get ads there. Those are all really good for awareness. And then for conversion, um, I tend to think just still or static images drive the best, like click through rates and conversion, just because if you think about serving someone an ad with the goal of getting them to purchase on site, not only are you asking them to read your caption, read your headline, watch your video, click through, buy, like that's way too much to ask of the user um, on a first ad exposure. So if their first exposure is that video, gets them interested, um, you know, a key element there is having your branding in the first three seconds. Um, if your branding is in the first few seconds, then that recall is gonna be much higher. Um, those videos, you know, focusing on what makes you different from, from competitors. Um, why they should buy your product, why why are you any different than any other coffee brand. So 
leading with video and then sequencing into a static tends to be just like the very well proven method. Um, you could also lead with a static too that might have like some animation on it or something like that um, as just like an element of interest. But um, yeah, I think people just think video, video, video. But yeah, when you think as a user about all those things that this brand wants you to do in that one ad exposure, it can just be really hard. Or I mean, how many times have you even watched a video ad in your feed on Facebook or Instagram, like in and it's its entirety, you know, like keeping those really short is also really important. Like six or 15 seconds six is really good, especially for YouTube. You know, that's going to be your most cost efficient way to reach people is with a bumper, which is a six second or a 15. Um, so that has really been a more recent change over the last four or five years is that short form video because people's attention spans are so much lower. Like they're just not going to pay much attention if you're asking them to watch an entire 30 second video when they're scrolling through their Instagram feed mindlessly, you know, unless they are like your follower then, or if they've been on your site or something where they already know who you are. And how much money, and I'm sure it varies by platform based on what you said about TikTok being lower than Facebook at this point, but what is the least amount you'd recommend, especially like a small business? Cause there's a lot of small businesses right now that are they want to do advertising, but if you reach out to a firm, it's really expensive and a lot of people are kind of stretched on dollars. What's the, the, the least amount, I don't know, on a monthly basis that you'd recommend somebody doing it? And then how long of a duration do you recommend before determining if it's a success or not? Yeah, um, it's a hard question. And I think one that we get asked a lot is, you know, what's the right budget and what's the perfect amount? But, um, you know, the budget really depends on how big your audience is. So, I typically wouldn't spend less than like a hundred bucks on a post just because, you know, I probably can't scale the learnings I get from that small of an investment. Um, I'm probably not going to move the dial that much. I might get like a couple purchases, but, um, you know, if you think about it on like a per post basis, you know, I probably wouldn't spend any less than that. But if my audience was super niche, like, I wanted to target everyone at a specific address, like a snap filter approach, like something like that, then that's going to be really cheap. So it really depends on your audience size. So whenever anyone says, you know, how much should I spend? The first thing I ask is, well, who do you want to target? Um, you know, what's the, what's the geography? What are the attributes of how we want to size this? And then once I know that audience size of, okay, X million people or 100,000 people or how many people are in this pool, which I can do on Facebook just to see. Then off of that, I'll say, okay, this is how much we can spend to reach this amount of these people. Um, so it's really dependent on the audience size. Um, and then what was the other part of the question? The How long of a duration? How long? Definitely at least a week, unless it's like time sensitive, you know, on social people love the like national holiday, like national coffee day. Like obviously that you wouldn't want to run for a week unless it was like a promo that you called out, you know, we're doing a week long sale for national coffee day. Like obviously that's more time sensitive. Um, but you know, if the ad platform only has like a few days to learn about this audience and serve these ads, you know, the longer the better basically with ads because then the platform is able to reach more people because I might have logged into Facebook today and you might not have not so you might not be reachable until tomorrow or a week from now whereas I'm reachable today so you want to allow time for people in your audience to be on the platform you want to allow time for the platform to be able to optimize well among this audience and get you the results you want so at least a week the longer the better um you know, you don't want to spend a hundred dollars over like six months, obviously. So you have to be mindful of things like that. But, um, what's like a, an ideal length of time when you say a hundred dollars a post? Um, if you were to, so if you were to put budget behind like the posts that you're putting up every month, you know, you're posting pretty frequently that, you know, you might want to say, okay, I'm going to pick there's four weeks in a month. I want to pick four of my posts that organically got the highest engagement rates. I'm going to put budget behind those. I'm going to run each of those for a week and maybe back to back against the same audience. Like that's an approach that I see a lot with organic and like how can you use all the organic insights that you have. Um, also, you know, with organic, like all of the people who follow you, you know, you can only reach so many of them. I'm sure you've seen against your follower count, you know, it's like two to 5% of 
is the amount of people that follow you that you're actually going to reach with a post without any budget behind it. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very low. So, you know, the a bare bones approach too is like, I'm just going to put some budget behind this to reach the people who follow me Own that I'm not followers. reaching, that I'm not reaching already. But it, then it's like, they already follow you. So I personally think sometimes that's a little bit of a waste. It's like, you know, they could seek out that content or maybe they'll see the next post, you know, that one's harder. And is that because the algorithms have changed that so like Instagram is the most obvious one when they change from chronological to ones you engage most with? Is that, top, yeah. Because I was looking through analytics of Instagram today before this just because I started actually realizing that this all existed and like out of our thousands and thousands of followers, it's a, a percentage of them that yeah. actually see the posts that we do. And it's 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 still a good number, but it is kind of depressing when you think about Oh, you've got this huge following, but you're not engaging with that many of yeah. them. And, and then you see the views on your stories and it's kind of the same group of people, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, in terms of like video, so if I'm creating a video to raise awareness and just, I guess the dimensions would be important. Instagram, you probably want to do the one by one and make it, is Facebook, is there a better kind of dimensions of the video, I guess, that work better for the... Yeah, so with ads that doesn't come into play quite as much because you're more so competing against other advertisers and you're being judged off of, you know, ad relevancy against other ads and there's different things that come into play. But for like an organic post, then, you know, the day that Facebook and Instagram decided to prioritize, you know, friend to friend content over like small businesses, brands, well, obviously they're doing that because they want people to spend more money on ads. Um, Then that will allow them to bump up to people's feeds because they're putting budget behind it. Um, also, you know, that's part of the reason why they don't push followers as much is because it's like, you know, if you're paying to get all these followers, but only a fraction of them are seeing the post, you know, is that really worth your investment? So, um, I wouldn't say like ad format comes into play as much unless it's organic, then they're going to prioritize video. You know, like you mentioned the people who engage with Folly Coffee content all the time, then they're going to see every post, you know, um, But it's definitely something to keep in mind of who you want to target is. Do you want to spend money against people who already know who you are to remind or like remind them that you're there? You know, that's a different messaging strategy. So um, all of those different audiences of like, if you've been on my site, if you follow me, you know, all these other qualifiers, it's important to nurture them too. You don't want to just say, okay, you already follow me, so I can just leave you be, you know, especially with. A, a coffee brand that's like a repeat purchase you want to remind maybe you know okay they're going to run out of this bag in 30 days so i'm going to target them every 30 days you know thinking about purchase cycles and things like that as well focusing on yeah that's a good almost retargeting the same customer and that that's the tough thing about coffee is i've, I've said it many times that we don't target high-end specialty coffee drinkers because this is the type of person that doesn't want to be told what to buy. They're not going to click on ads. They do their research. That's how they discover new coffees. They go on recommendations. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting just bombarded with coffee ads on Facebook because all the stuff I search is coffee. And so I'm literally just like, they think I'm just an extreme coffee enthusiast. And everything I see is like fresh roasted, quality, small batch. What is like when you think of differentiation, and it's something that's really tough with coffee. What types of things would you recommend for an ad to really draw somebody? Like if we're talking about folly, just being critical of folly at this point. Like, what is it that really makes us different? And I, to not put you on the spot, I'll say I think it is. And on out of those. What do you think is the most compelling that if I'm going to run a video ad to drive awareness, a video to get somebody to watch, and then run an ad on top of that, that if somebody engaged with that, we'll try to sell them on the coffee later. I think the things that Folly has different is the branding is probably the thing people talk about the most, that the packaging is very different. And again, I think the quality of the coffee is the best part of it all. But that's not a really big point of differentiation because there's a lot of amazing roasters out there. So I'm talking things that are just purely different is the packaging I think is one thing that's pretty eye-catching uh obviously like what Jeff is doing being like gaining national recognition uh, re- recognition as a coffee taster roasting the coffees he's the one doing all the profiling I think that's pretty compelling um just the, I guess the fact that we tried to appeal more to someone that doesn't know a ton about coffee 
uh, and we try to be approachable to get people to get more into coffee in an unpretentious way, like what out, what out of those do we focus on with an ad to try to get people like just to watch that video and potentially be interested? Yeah, I think you definitely don't need to only choose one. I think when you think about social content, even just organically, like having almost themes of content, like you just mentioned, that focus on each of those things is really important to make sure that you're hitting on here are the things that make me different. Um, you know, with my own behavior on Instagram, packaging is really important to me. Like I save stuff all the time if it just stands out and it isn't like every other, like that's why I bought a Quip toothbrush because, you know, I got this ad. I was like, what? This is like a super trendy toothbrush. I want that. Like, you know, there's going to be people like me who are really visually driven and based off of that. But then, you know, if you're going after coffee nerds, they're going to want more than just packaging. So um, I think testing that is really going to be the first step to just see what works the best. But in reality, those different tactics are going to work better against different audiences. So maybe you target each of those differently. You know, maybe with packaging, you target people who are more artsy, more driven by um, those sorts of elements of interest. And then maybe for, you know, the the Jeff content, that's more of people interested in the craft and like the, the techniques, maybe they're more into cooking. Like finding those different attributes, a lot of the times it's honestly just starts with a hunch. Like, well, I feel like people who this is going to resonate with have these behaviors um, and targeting that way so that that messaging is really tailored to each person um so yeah i mean the the packaging alone too like when you think about the colors those are going to pop and feed a lot so recall is going to be really strong when you just have that branding right up front um what what's hard when you don't have the branding really prevalent or the packaging really prevalent is some you might have a kick-ass video someone might, might watch the whole thing be super engaged the whole time but if Folly's never mentioned in there. If you don't have the branding on your head or on your shirt or whatever it is, you know, they might later tell a friend, oh, I watched this awesome video, but they're not going to say this awesome video by Folly Coffee, you know? So you have to make sure that branding is always present, even if it's just in a subtle way, because just having your like handle as the only branding, that's not going to be enough for someone to recall Folly as the name, you know? So being really smart about maybe it's a folly logo in the corner of a YouTube video the whole time it's playing. Maybe it's, you know, some sort of subtle element like that. Um, that really is going to help in people remembering, oh, it was an ad for folly. And then the last thing that this uh, was kind of a recent thought that came up is realizing during this time that our email list of customers was almost like the most engaged because it's so easy to unsubscribe. Like it, people think of email lists as different than an Instagram follow. An Instagram follow, I probably am not gonna see your posts anyway, but if I stay on your email list, you're definitely going to email me mm -hmm. again. So if I don't like what you're sending me, unsubscribe right away. Some people argue that's like, oh no, people are lazy, they don't do that. I, I think most people do at this point. And so in a strategy of using paid advertising to grow your email following uh, and what would be the most effective way to collect emails in a way that people aren't going to be annoyed when you actually send them an email uh, of picking up people who will be interested in what you're doing in an effective way where you're collecting a lot of people's emails to be able to communicate with them later. Yeah, I think with email lists, um, it's super important to nurture those people and give them a reward for signing up. So what am I going to gain out of doing this? You know, maybe if I'm targeted with a carousel on Instagram, the, the multiple images that you swipe through, maybe I'm targeted with a carousel that shows all of the different flavors of folly. And then maybe it says, you know, if you want updates when our newest flavors come out or our limited edition, like people love stuff like limited edition or exclusive club, like you're getting this benefit being a part of this email list that you aren't by just following us on Instagram, um, providing that benefit that's different and making sure that that's really clear when you're getting people to sign up for that. Um, offers, promos, that sort of stuff always work. Like, you know, if you want to get this exclusive offer, sign up for, I mean, I do that all the time. I'm like, oh, I want my 20% off. So I'm going to sign up for your email list. 
yeah, I unsubscribe a lot of the times for those, but those are for the big guys that send emails like every day that I'm just like, this is too much. So, so almost just being clear about, Hey, if you sign up for the, having a reward, so here's what you get if you sign up, but then being really clear up front that this is what we send out. Yeah. Which is, I, again, yeah, I'm the same way that if I get an email every day, like I don't care how much I'm yeah, into what you're doing, you're care. out. And so I try to be very picky about when we email, when we do, it's either a really big promotion uh, every once in a while, it'll be something that's a big deal for us where if, you know, like the, we almost won that mug competition, that mm -hmm. could have been a five grand mug prize for us. Like just stuff that's important. And if you follow folly, like would probably be interesting to you. That's a very good point about being clear upfront about this is what your email is, because that's where I hate giving my email is when it's like, uh, I, I want that 10% off. But I know I'm going to get yeah. blasted with emails. And that's why I just had to clear out my Gmail because it was 100% full and I had 39,000 promotional emails. Yep. And so that's that's a really interesting point of just being like, almost if there's a way of, here's the reward anyway, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. And I think one thing that I really like when I sign up for email lists is when they give you options of how often do you want to receive these updates? What types of updates do you want to receive? Um, so, you know, you're not sending emails every day, but if you were, you could have people opt in to, you know, I want a weekly summary of everything else, or I only want emails when you have promos. Like, I think that is also really nice because then people will stick around longer when they're only getting the information that they want. Um, so that, that is nice. I think the best way to gain those emails on Facebook, I mean... I enter emails a lot for giveaways. Giveaways definitely are similar to getting that promo code when you're buying for the first time for a brand where you're probably going to unsubscribe fairly quickly after, but um, giveaways are nice. Um, also, there's lead generation forms within Facebook where you don't even have to leave the app and you can just fill out, you know, first name, last name, email. Um, the less form fields, the better in general when you're trying to get email addresses as well. You know, if I ask you for your birthday and like all these other fields, you know, maybe I'll give you my birthday if I know I'm getting like an offer on my birthday. But um, the simpler, the better when you're trying to gain people in that sort of way for those lists. Even something like what's your email and then have a ranking of like how what kind of a coffee person are you and yeah. have have a multiple choice of like i know everything there is to know all the way down to what do you mean like yeah <laughs> i just even though that would probably give me some insight into who's signing up for these emails definitely and i've seen a lot too like how to hear about us and like that that can be another really interesting way to give credit to you know, if social media is accounting for like 80% of people's answers to that field, um, yes, it's one more thing for them to fill out, but for smaller companies, you know, that can be really insightful to see like, oh, I just Googled Minneapolis coffee roasters, or I got a Facebook ad, or my friend told me about it, like that can be really helpful um, as well. And I think with emails too, you have to think about it similar to a conversion campaign where you know, you might not get an email from someone who's never heard of you before. So also thinking, you know, who makes the most sense to target with that ad? And it's probably going to be people who have already engaged with me in some way. Um, or if it is a new person and you're asking for their email, that has to be a very clear payoff. That has to be, hey, we're Fly Coffee. Here's an intro to us, you know, and here, if you sign up for our email list, you'll get X percent off your first order. You know, that payoff is extra important when people are newer to the brand. Is that something that's built into the lead generation tool? Could you have it that it automatically sends them an email or would that be dependent on the platform that you're on? Um, you can choose how you want to get those emails. The easiest way that I've done is it'll just be like a downloadable list and you'll just get like an Excel file. So what I'll usually do in a lead gen campaign is just run it. And then once it's over, I'll just download the list of all the emails. Um, but yes, you know, theoretically every day you could go in download that and then just email the new people so that it's like that same day um, or automate it in a better way. But it's super easy. I mean, it's pretty, I've tested doing that versus, you know, directing someone to a landing page where then I try to get their email. And, you know, the more that people can stay in app, the better. Um, you know, if they don't have to leave the Facebook interface and it's just right there, you know, that's what people want to do. That is a perfect transition of staying in app to kind of the last thing we should talk about today, 
with that big announcement last Thursday, Mark Zuckerberg, robot self, going on the big announcement that we are going heavier into e-commerce. I like how, of course, they we're all in this together using that messaging that we're, this is for you when really it's, it's e-commerce is something they've been trying to crack the code for for years. They are launching, it's called Facebook Shops and Instagram Shop, or I have them flipped around. But so based on the research I did today is this is what it is. It's one storefront for your e-commerce business that's going to be both Facebook and Instagram. They're not going to be separate. It's going to be one fully customizable store with the key difference being. So right now, if you go to the Folly Instagram or you go to the Folly Facebook, you can shop, but it says visit this product on the website. So it will, and I'm again, I'm telling you what you know probably already, but I'm kind of recapping what I learned. You go to the Facebook shop, it says visit on website. It takes you to our website, takes you out of the app. Instagram, you click shop, it does the exact same thing. And so they've created a platform now where it's Facebook shops and it can keep you in the app. One second, this says low on battery. I really don't want to run out of battery during all this. Okay. And so you use that single storefront to shop out of both. And I'm very conflicted what I think about it. So the rollout time is apparently they started Thursday for Facebook shops immediately. And they're giving preference to people who already had the Instagram shop or something like that. And then over time, if you're a business on Facebook or Instagram, they will send you an email that now they can onboard you onto the platform. And the big things, the the big differences I saw is there's they're going to maybe put in loyalty clubs that if you have someone who's buying consistently, uh, they are. And yeah. And so the, the, the big thing about it that, I like is exactly what you said is that that in app ability you never leave the app you can that, that impulse purchase is increased like crazy because you can be in the app apple pays way too easy in app boom you've bought it and then you continue scrolling as opposed to jumping back and forth things i don't like is it's run on the shopify platform so if you're already on that it's really good for you we're not we use squarespace for our website so it'd be an entirely new platform I'm curious, based on what you know about it, how do you think this will impact shopping? Uh, and will it be something that you think has a great effect to the buying habits of people, what they're buying, how they find what they're looking for? Uh, and how, I guess, nervous should I be or how much attention should I be paying to this and being proactive of making sure that we're spending the time and money to make sure that we are looking really good on that platform? Yeah, I think this is Facebook's move to make it easier to shop and check out and buy, especially during these times when people are buying via online much more than pre-COVID time. So they want to make it as easy as possible for people to buy, check out without leaving the app. Um, you know, in its previous state, as you mentioned, you would have to go outbound to a company's website. And then let's say you wanted to keep scrolling on Facebook when you were done. That's just like annoying to go back and forth. So they want to make it as easy as possible for people. You know, Instagram, I think, is really starting to take after Pinterest in the way of being more shoppable. And that search tab on Instagram is really similar to Pinterest. Um, which is a very shoppable platform. So I think they're trailing after Pinterest for sure. I'm I'm sure they want to compete with Amazon here by making it just easy for anyone to have a shoppable option within the platform. So, you know, a lot of small businesses that might not even have e-com on their site, maybe they're like, oh, well, this is going to be way easier for me to just set it up within Facebook. You know, Facebook takes, I think I read like a 5% fee so that's something to be mindful of, of how much of that money you're actually getting back. Um, another thing to be mindful of is, you know, if someone's buying off of your own website, you have access to that person, you know, that's an audience you can gain insights from and target again. But this, you know, without them leaving the Facebook app, it's a little bit more of that, what we refer to as a walled garden where, you know, Facebook now is going to do what they want with mm. this audience. Um, I... You know, I don't know when I think about my own behavior, if I will really check out within there. I think I would rather go to a brand site to see, can I get a promo code? Can I, you know, browse in a different way? I think it's going to be a while until people change their behavior to be shopping within there and actually checking out. 
Um, so that checkout piece is really interesting. I think what I do like about it is that they are making it accessible for anyone. Like anyone can set up a Facebook shop. All you have to do is have like a tax identification number. You have to like agree to their merchant terms and have like a physical product, but otherwise anyone can do it. So that is really exciting for smaller companies, as I mentioned, that might not even have, um, checkout or e-com on their Mm -hmm. website. Um, so it's almost making it easier for people who aren't super mature in the e-commerce market, but for people who are, because that's my first reaction when I hear anything from a huge company is you go, okay, there's someone over there that's really, really smart and probably doing something that's not fully sketchy, but is on the line of sketchy. And that's a really good point about the walled garden is like, okay, now I don't know who just bought that. It, that's their information. Then it's almost their way of gaining. And my understanding is their big reasoning behind it from a revenue standpoint is they do take that percentage of each sale, but they think the bigger opportunity is ad spend. That if you get yeah. more, <laughs> this ties right back to what you said at mm-hmm. the beginning. The person who's more likely to spend money inefficiently and impulsively is someone who doesn't know how all of this works. And so someone who's like, oh, it's so easy now to start a shop. I can now finally sell my product online. I don't know how to do a website. This is perfect. So you start a Facebook, you sign up for Shopify for nine bucks a month for the light store, $30 a month for the little more customizable one. Most people will probably go for the cheaper option just to be able to sell. And then, so they spent their $9 a month there and then they don't know how the advertising works. So I get these posts every time I post a folly post that says, if you want this post to reach mm-hmm. 15,000 more people, just spend $10. And you're like, whoa, 15,000 people. That's how they get you. And so it, I think that is an interesting point. I think, <laughs> okay, that made me feel way better. I got really anxious when they announced that because I go, oh man, it's like another thing that I have to think about and be worried about. But it probably is the more, the less developed e-commerce businesses that this will both benefit, but also potentially what is going to drive that revenue for Facebook, which is also Instagram. Um, And I think it's an interesting point about buying patterns, especially of younger people, which tends to, you know, that kind of 25 to 40 range is the core customer for Folly uh, based on our analytics is that I think these are the the type of people that are buying high-end food and beverage, especially probably are going to the website. They want to know who, they're buying and from research and just a quick couple paragraphs to be like, is this, is this a local company that's independently owned? What, who, who is doing this? Uh, so it, there is almost a lack of benefit for somebody that's really quality focused that I don't necessarily want someone who's just super impulsively buying it. I want somebody who knows what we're about before buying it. So it makes me feel better. Are you very well versed on like SEO? I am not. Because the other thing that made me nervous about it, um, and I know this isn't like particularly your wheelhouse and I don't know much about it, is it uses the Shopify platform, which is like its own separate website. So how that, and I'm not asking you this, it's just kind of something I got worried about when I was researching Mm -hmm. it is our website on Squarespace, the SEO is really good if you're searching specifically for Folly, obviously, but even just Minnesota coffee, we're starting to show up now. Mm Uh, and I would be nervous about starting a separate platform of Squarespace that that's could potentially divert yeah. traffic. I don't think that Facebook shops would rank when you're searching. Um, so I don't think you would have to worry about SEO since it's within the app. Um, so I wouldn't think of that as much of a concern as just like you said, it's just another thing. It's just at some point giving the consumer lots of options is good, but also it's a lot of clutter. It's a lot of, oh, I can go here or here or here or here when like a simplified experience is sometimes just better. Um, I think a lot of the reason why they did it too is they had a lot of their advertisers back out because of COVID. So a lot Mm. of the big brands, let's think like grocery brands that might be just flying off the shelves without ad spend. So maybe the first thing they cut is their Facebook budget because they can just do that. Um, so Facebook was really running into issues, um, in the last quarter hmm. with all of this of advertisers cutting their spend. So they're like, we need to figure out something to do. Cause that's where a majority of their revenue comes from. So, um, you know, just like you said, the people who don't read the merchant terms, fine print, you know, to see the 5% that they're taking and might just think, Oh, this is easy. This is great. You know, Um, taking those things into account, taking into, I I think it's worth testing. You know, I don't see it 
being adopted widely anytime soon. I think there's a payoff to a website that you probably won't be able to get from a Facebook shop, but um, it's definitely interesting. I think they're for sure trying to compete with like Amazon's and shoppable. Yeah, I think the impulsivity of ads could go through the roof if you have like a high impulse item. If you have like a low spend, high impulse item that is... You know, our, our coffee can go up upwards of $20. It's not necessarily as much of an impulse item as it's something that might be $5 that if it's in an ad and you can shop right in the app, it might yeah. be more important. So, that's... But at the same time, you know, how much harder is it really for me to click on what you already have on your shopping tab and just check out from my card on your website, you know? Yeah. It's not that much more of I mean, a just hassle. like the swipe up feature takes you right to the page. Yeah. So it's really like so, the same amount of clicking. You know, it's not that difficult in existing options prior to this. Hmm. Well, that makes me feel a lot better because that, that was making me a little bit nervous, but I can go down rabbit holes of new things yeah. and start to realize what they might be. But mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I don't know that they'll ever compete with Amazon in terms of product search. Most people no. don't even Google products anymore. They just look for it on Amazon yeah. if they're looking for something specific. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. I've got, this, this is awesome. That's, that's an hour right there. And yeah. so lot of dense information and I'm definitely going to run with this in the coming weeks here. So lots of details and nitty gritty things to wrap your brain around. But, um, yeah, I think just being smart about where you're investing ad dollars, what updates are most relevant for your brand rather than just, Oh, there's an update. So I need to do it. You know, does that make sense for you? Does the messaging strategy that you're giving to the person you're targeting make sense for them or like some of the takeaways. Yeah. That's what I always say is like, if this ad was presented to me, would I care? If not, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Interesting. Well, thanks for coming by. Yeah. Uh, this will be going up this Sunday. Uh, hopefully the video looks, looks like it's recording. So we are good to go. I'll end this episode as we do every other one and say have a nice day.